Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 642. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's January 26th, 2020. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We've been doing this almost 10 years. Uh, you're going to watch the show and say, you guys are amateurs. No, but we've been doing this 10 years and we're still amateurs. But um, let's before we get too far into the program, it really helps if you like this program. Uh, YouTube is now starting to recommend us again, and Facebook is recommending our program uh, to people who are Anglicans and Christians, and that really helps. And that's done because you've liked the program and they will promote through free advertising programs that are liked frequently. We really appreciate that. Please go to the comment section. That's where the show continues. A lot of great comments this week. We read them all and uh, we respond to the ones where we want to respond. Not all of them. Not, that'd be silly. Uh, and what else do I want to say? Oh, share the program. Please share this program. Um, you do that on YouTube. There's a little share button. You click it. On Facebook, there's another share button. You click that. And you can share it with your friends, family, foes, whoever you want to. If you're not subscribed, I, I hate to say this every week, but there's people who watch this program who are not subscribed yet. Click that little red rectangle and the bell and you will be subscribed. That little thunder you hear in the background, that's George playing with his microphone. No, my <laughs> mouse. <I'm laughs> you play your mouse. To move. I now have a screen that allows me to have you and my <laughs> notes at simultaneously, nice. so I'm not always going to be looking down. Uh -huh. Upgrades. Up now. That's cool. Yes. All right, so before we get too far, how are you doing this week, George? Oh, busy, busy. Uh, even though church hasn't met for two Sundays because of a, a severe COVID outbreak in the county, 70% of the people in the uh, hospital in our county have uh, COVID. Uh, it's spiking up really bad, so we made the decision to only do online for the last two weeks. We'll reassess this weekend. But I have to tell you, I haven't had a day off since this began. Monday through Sunday, I haven't taken sure. vacation. And man, it's starting to get old and tiring. We had our uh, vestry meeting last night, and uh, there was a vote taken that we are all sick and tired of COVID. You know, mm -hmm. it can it can be over now. Uh, and it's just there's the light at the end of the tunnel nobody said all clear it's all over this vaccine offers a light at the end of the tunnel um it looks like we can you know pretty much provide some immunity from this horrible virus but that's still you know almost a year away before the entire population gets the vaccine my parents got it yesterday i haven't heard any uh uh reports from mom about how good or bad it was but uh, she will tell me she's that type of person i contacted the florida department of health because the governor has announced that churches now may register as vaccination sites hmm. and so we i want the world to see the brand new clean carpet in my parish hall uh and all the old uh, posters taken down saying join alpha for 2014. <laughs> uh, but we Florida's had a pretty good rollout of the vaccine. They've done it solely by age, and they're basically working down age, and uh, so no special workers, no politicians, none of this or that. And they are broadening the uh, scope of who can offer vaccines: uh, school nurses, uh, health clinics, uh, and then it's now uh, if you have a uh, medical. Uh, licensed uh, nurse, practitioner, pharmacist, or doctor uh, who would be willing to work at this place, you may register your church or nonprofit mm -hmm. uh, to be a free vaccine site. Now, we only have a single site in the county, so, uh, I, you know, it's that's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. uh, but, you know, but, but the, here's the funny thing. The uh, people, the woman I talked to at the health department, Tallahassee, said, their thinking is that this is going to be with us in this sort of form until September. Yeah. And that really is depressing uh, on so many levels. No, it is. I mean, you're worried from this. I'm worried from this. Um, everybody I talked to was just completely COVID worry. Um, 
and it, it's hard to put into to words exactly what this has done to our our nation to our world uh, to our economies to our church uh, to our politics uh, COVID is just this mark in time that isn't a single day event like the World Trade Center was. Uh, it, you know, this is lasting uh, a long time where the soul just gets kind of tired of it. I wake up and I had to go to Starbucks to get my, my refill of my coffee grounds today so I could have fresh French press because I ran out. And here I go again. I'm getting in my car. I'm putting my face mask on. I'm going in there. I had to explain to the lady three times through my mask what exactly I wanted. And it's just, it's depressing to continue to do that. The humans are not designed to walk around wearing masks. It, it's it's part of this weariness. We're, we're sick and tired of it. Now, George, I uh, currently at an RV community here in Florida where everybody's 65 to 95, a couple hundred fives they walk around with no mask at all because they were vaccinated already. Uh, you guys have um, vaccination of the elder population here in Florida. I think I'm the only one in this community that has not been vaccinated. So they, they stop well, wearing masks right, right the away. Governor, the governor has announced that uh, we're, we're not vaccinating carpetbaggers. Uh, unless you have a Florida driver's license or a Florida utility bill, you can't get the free vaccine because we're getting all these people from New York coming down what? to get vaccines because <laughs> new york is so dysfunctional it's very dysfunctional uh, well new york is normally dysfunctional but uh uh well the but you know they're right now the you can only get it if you're over 65 and you have to sign up uh online mm -hmm. um or if you're in a nursing home they've already done those who are in facilities but uh exciting time all right, so let's move on to some good news. Um, we've talked about Lord Carey uh, in the news now for at least a year and a half, two years. Uh, retired Archbishop of Canterbury was uh, told by the Lambeth Palace, you are no longer allowed to officiate within the Church of England. And we were surprised. What, what's this? Well, what did he do? George, what did he do? And George, I don't know, let's look into it. You're friends with some of his family. You contacted, got in there, said nobody knows what he did. They're not telling him what he did. And this was, you know, two years ago news. And so finally we got some of the story that um, Lord Carey was in possession of some information about one of those accused bishops, and he didn't act on it fast enough, uh, according to people in this day and age. And therefore, if you were not act on it fast enough, too bad. We're cutting you off. It's not even that bad, Kevin. It's not even that bad. Um, basically, the church, the Diocese of Oxford uh, did what I called Emily Latella. If any of you remember Saturday Night Live in the 1970s, Gilda Radner would play a character on the news who would go off uh, on this rant about some issue, and then she would be told by uh, Chevy Chase that she was wrong, and she would turn to the camera and say, never mind. <laughs> Uh, the Church of England has turned to George Carey and said, never mind, uh, because evidently in 1982 or 83, when Lord Carey was the principal of Trinity College in Bristol, a theological college, there was a part-time non-residential student named uh, Jonathan Smythe. Smythe would go on to be the famous abuser tied to the boys' camps in the evangelical movement, and the, the accusation was that because he was the principal of the college, he was in a, he was in a position uh, to supervise uh, Jonathan Smythe, and therefore he should have done something about this abuser. It's like saying, okay, you were Lee Harvey Oswald's social studies teacher. Why did you not prevent the assassination? That's right. John you you should have known. How dare you? And, the, and George Carey said, this is a part-time, non-residential, non-clergy student taking a course. I won't pound the desk, Kevin. I see your face. <laughs> and I'm mean, just going for the volume here. <laughs> there's a part-time student. I can't remember this guy. And I had no knowledge of what he was doing. And the Church of England said, well, I guess you're right. Well, then 
you're not really a danger anymore to people, so we'll let you be a priest again and a bishop again. Well, did the uh, Oxford Statement come with an apology? No. Uh, no, of course not. Now, the, the talk within the Church of England was that this was being pressed by Lambeth Palace because they wanted to sh be shown to be tough on, a, on safeguarding issues. And what it really did show was that Lambeth Palace was tough on making harmless people examples of safeguarding issues. Well, John Santamo screwed up royally, and yet he just got a peerage from the, the British government, even though his uh, safeguarding record was one that would normally have precluded him from any sort of government honor. But we don't talk about Santamo because no. he's he is what he is. He is what he is. Um, but I do notice the Church of England in Lambeth Palace is really tough on dead bishops. You know, you, <laughs> or ones that are just about to drop dead, like yes. George Carey. Yeah. He's in his late eighties. Oh. Uh, and but no, but this is just it's a belated that you know, Justin Welby, uh talks a good game. He's never made any sort of uh, amends for the George Bell fiasco. He's promised to talk to the victims of uh, the abuse by Jonathan Smythe, whom Welby knew and they were contemporaries and he was aware of the abuse for a long time now. And he made all these public promises and statements and the bureaucratic machinery has said, okay, we'll allow you to meet with him, but you may only ask these questions, and here's his prepared answer. In other words, it's a, it's a farce. Um, it's just a farce. We now have a development uh, that was reported in the Daily Telegraph that a report by the safeguarding group uh, 318, 918, I'm sorry, okay. That's okay. I should know their name, has been completed on Jonathan Fletcher, and it was given to Emmanuel Church Wimbledon, the parish that ordered this. And they're going to hold it for 28 days before releasing it. And they're going to do some fact-checking. Well, the joke of it is, they have all along said, we knew nothing, nothing, nothing. They did the Sergeant Schultz uh, about Jonathan Fletcher's uh, abusive, uh, unchristian behavior. But now they need to fact check something that they know nothing about. So what this means is that the insiders who are going to get blasted have 28 days to think of an excuse, change come up the with story, the, yes. change the story, uh -huh. decide this is when I'm going on sabbatical uh, on my yeah you know, round the world yacht trip, and I'm not going to be reached. Change my email address. Yes, it just is so much of insider old boy prevarication old boy jobs I don't know it, it must be extremely discouraging to try to teach justice under the Church of England because they just do such a good job in smothering it well what a great transition George I want to thank you for this uh, the ACNA put out a uh, pastoral statement on same-sex attraction and identity last week and I thought it'd be a great time to talk about it because George and I, we've been here before. I remember the Windsor Report, the Dramani Report, all these things that we chased after for the church to respond to the Episcopal Church back uh, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, 6 years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, and trying to say this is what the Anglican Communion believes on same-sex attraction. And we're going to tell you that, but was it, there was never a final decision. There was a report, but we want to talk about it more. The Winds Report says, uh, in one of the few articles, we may have to walk away from each other, but we're really not done talking about it. And there was always this, this desire for Indaba. In sh uh, 12 short months, the ACNA put together this report on um, same-sex attraction and identity. And at the very end, it doesn't say we need more time. It doesn't say uh, we need to talk this out and meet and make sure that no, we didn't hurt anybody's feelings. The report is what the report is, George. And I'm like, this is so new. I've never had somebody issue a report and said, that's it. It's over. What are we talking about? Well, 
the how the College of Bishops of the ACNA met for, had their winter meeting, and at the close of the meeting, they released, along with their communique, a uh, pastoral statement from the College of Bishops called Sexuality and Identity. This was the 20th, uh, 19th of January, about a week or so ago. Now, I will say they made one marketing mistake, a little lacuna here. <laughs> They had uh, a cover letter written by Bishop Stuart Roosh, one of the members of the task force. The letter was fine, wonderful. The problem was photo. It looked to me like a cover shot from a Herman and the Hermits album, uh, you know, sort of a 60s. He has a bishop's vest and he a white shirt. has a purple shirt, bishop's but, vest. Uh, it, but the way it, it, way it sits on him he looks like a, a glam band from the early 70s with but affixed to a kenny rogers beard and mustache and it i'm just thinking uh, it, well uh, okay i, I want to that re-record being, that's the, the important stuff uh, that's this, the important this, stuff i want to re-record just this uh, uh this topic uh because uh, i kind of left you blank when i was when i i'll do the transition part and then uh my intro just left you with too much pause you're like what, what what am i talking about so let's let's do redo that again let me put this here don't forget to take this edit out all right george what a great time for a transition to our next story um and this story is in my mind 20 years in the making only because the story has an ending one of the few stories of the Anglican community that actually does the ACNA put out a statement after their latest House of Bishops meeting on same-sex attraction and identity, and it is one powerful, well-written, very orthodox um, document that talks about how the House of Bishops wishes this topic to be discussed within the ACNA. And I read it now uh, two or three times, looking for the flaws found none i'm not a theologian i'm sure if you went you know down the rabbit hole you could find something somewhere in this document you didn't like but george you and i have been down this road before we went through the winds report which was two or three years uh, uh putting together a document that says in the end we still need to keep talking about it drama team and all these different conferences we went to looking for an answer from the anglican communion on human sexuality and they always said here's what the church believes but we're really not done discussing it yet this document says this is what we believe and that's that you know and i thought well we need to talk about this george finally something put pen to paper and it is a well-written document and I find no flaw with it. Do you? No, that doesn't mean that people aren't complaining. No. Uh, the, the, the document has all the right critics. You've got the people on the, the sort of what I call the crank wing. Why are you even bothering doing this stuff? This is so self-evident that even talking about it is a sign that you're about to go soft. We have that wing of the church, and then we have the wing that says, oh, my nephew's cousin's brother's best friend's neighbor at the age of 37 decided he wanted to become a transvestite, but he wanted to be a lesbian transvestite so he could still go like date girls but wear dresses. Why can't God recognize that wholesomeness in his life? So we got the two extreme wings, and usually they're found on the coasts, California and the east. Uh, and it's us normal people in the middle who have to uh, carry the water. The statement reaffirms traditional tr- traditional Christian views on marriage, sexuality, and sexual identity. It is pro-science, pro-gospel, pro-God, pro-philosophy, pro all the muses you have them in there. It is a, and those on the left who criticize it come at it from a criticism of political correctness and wokeness. It is a definitely an unwoke document, yeah, no. and there are there is a growing group within the ACNA that is very very woke, usually on issues of critical race theory, but usually they're the same people that are complaining about this. So, it's a very fine document. It's a very good teaching document. The only the only uh, reservation I would make was its cover. Well, you don't like the purple vested bishop? 
No, uh, <laughs> they released it uh, with a cover letter by Bishop Stuart Rouge. One of my favorite and bishops. All right. Now, they he ha they have him wearing a purple button-down vest with a white long sleeve shirt, and the way he just looks like a record cover from Herman and the Herbert Hermits, you know, from the nineteen sixties, the monkeys, or a glam band of the early seventies. Uh, but the thing is, instead of the having the hair that would go with that sort of outfit, sort of a mod sixties Carnaby Street look, he's got a Kenny Rogers beard and mustache. So it's just, you know, you got two genres here that are really tearing at each other. Uh, it, so apart from the cover, I no, think it's from, great. No, I, yeah, I, I, for me it was great. For me, it's the organization that put together as well. The ACNA, 80% of the bishops in the ACNA, given this task, would have come up with something pretty close to this. You know, go in and put together our statement on sexual identity. Okay, no big deal. Given this task into the Episcopal Church, you, you give three or four bishops the task, go write a, a, a well-researched doctrinal letter on what we believe on sexual identity. What, what would the results be, George? Well, when they've done this in the past, they come up with things like blaming the Poles for the Holocaust. Uh, remember that? Did. No, I <laughs> they remember did that. that. Uh, <laughs> just like, what? Press conference, and and this, the Bishop of Massachusetts is suffering. Uh, oh, Harris, uh, yep. not Barbara Harris, the other one. The other one, yeah. Gail Harris goes off on this tangent about the Poles are responsible for the gassing of the Jews in the Second World War. What, what planet are we on here? Or if we don't go off on such silliness, we get these, you know, it's God's will that cats and dogs get married so that we can have a true expression of cats and dogs' humanity. Uh, you know, just... Well, no, the, we, can write, we can write this stuff. A computer can generate this nonsense. The Holy Spirit is doing something new. That's the, the general line. You know, the Holy Spirit was wrong for 2,000 years. The Holy Spirit has come around. The Holy Spirit is doing something new. And that's the, been the general line. Uh, this pastoral statement by the ACNA, you know, I, I, I never want to say I have doubts, but I've met so many bishops in my travels. And I've gone to all these conferences and gone to all these committee meetings and gone to all these Windsor Report uh, type things where you're just like, you're waiting for that final statement. Here is our final statement, but we're not done yet. We're going to meet more. We want to be sure that everybody understands we didn't want to hurt their feelings. And this isn't about hurting feelings. This is about telling you the expression of the church, the desire of the House of Bishops, and the Word of God. Okay, cool. All right. So good job, ACNA. Um, I hope that other uh, provinces around the world will adopt this or something similar. And um, I hope you don't have to sit here and read it 25 times to finally find something that's wrong with it. It's a, a well-written document. What else did we have in the news? I turned off the wrong page. One second, back it up. This, the, oh, we have the two African items follow up from last week's sure. uh, video. Let's uh, talk about that. You, we reported last week that uh, um, Archbishop Stanley uh, Intigali I'm to be sure. Yeah, yes. yeah sorry. <laughs> just want to be sure I got it right. Uh, was accused uh, by the House of Bishops in Uganda of uh, having an adulterous affair with a married woman uh, who was the wife of a rector. And he kind of went silent for a while. Now we have his statement and apology, George. Yes. Uh, when we. Anglican and Anglican Unscripted broke this news, including beating out the Kent Ugandan press on it. And so when we came forward with this news for about half a day, we were vilified by people in Africa. Uh, how dare you say these terrible lies about the Archbishop? Well, later in the day, Foley Beach released his statement on behalf of GAFCON asking for prayer in this situation. And then the following day, Archbishop Ntigali went to Twitter and made this statement. I would like to apologize for my actions as we all have been bought that are prone to sin. 
but as the Bible teaches forgiveness, it is in these trying times that we must walk the talk. I apologize to my family, the church you've begun, to the whole Christian fraternity, and most importantly, repent to the Most High. Nothing can be done to account for or take away this but the blood of Christ. I'm sorry, Uganda. Forgive me, God. That was his only public utterance. Mm -hmm. And still, many people in Uganda would not believe it. They did not believe it. And the story has sort of taken a darker turn. The Archbishop uh, Kazimba met with the uh, husband of the, the woman. And we made a mistake. We said he was a rector. He's not. He's a lecturer at Bishop Barham Theological College. Mm -hmm. He's still a priest, yeah. but he's a theological professor. And we had been told, uh, or we had been told orally that the issue arose after the wife, the, 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 the priest, gave birth to Father, gave birth to a child fathered by Stanley and Tagali. That was not in the communique. However, subsequent to the time, a divorce action has been filed in court where the woman is accusing uh, the husband of cruelty, the husband is responding, alleging infidelity, and the House of Bishops and the leaders of the Church of Uganda are really beside themselves that an archbishop would have an affair, he would have an affair with the wife of another priest, and that would lead to a child born out of wedlock. So this is a massive political, this is a wonderful scandal for the Ugandan African tabloids, because they, and also you'll see this in the American and English gay press, well, here, one of these people beating us up about being gay. Well, look, they can't keep their pants on either. Therefore, uh, one is bad as the other. And the thing is, Archbishop Kazimba has said, yes, one is bad as the other. Mm -hmm. That in his uh, January 13th letter to the House of Bishops, he said this infidelity is just as bad as the practices of homosexual behavior that we're condemning, and we must condemn all of this infidelity all of this unfaithfulness to God's word. So this story is going to continue as it gets dragged through the courts into divorce settlements and paternity tests, who is the father of this child. So we'll see this pop up again and again, but Archbishop Stanley's daughter, uh, he held a big engagement party for 200 plus people this weekend at his home in the country. And the press came because he's a national figure and he was asked uh, uh, about the scandal as he's giving its daughter away in a big party, which is not probably what he wanted to talk about. And his response to the press is, the devil is a liar, which has caused the press to speculate, is he now saying that all that came before are lies and his and the and the Antigali loyalists are taking up the chant that all of this is a put up job to destroy a man of God. So it's 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 a miserable situation. It is. But the Archbishop, there's no doubt as to what took place. There are doubts as to some of the particulars. No, but um, we, need, we, we haven't need had to... a paternity test with the no. DNA evidence. But we have had the pleadings in the divorce case. We have the accusations. We have the words of the Ugandan contacts that we have spoken with that saying this is this really is causing them some grief. It is, but this is something we can lift up in prayer. Definitely pray for the spouses in this. Uh, pray for this uh, child as well. What what a situation to be brought out into the world and uh, you know. Well, great. I think. I think there, there were several comments to, to, on this point that I think we need to reiterate, mm -hmm. that the Church of Uganda did not hide this. No. Now, part of one of the criticisms was, how can two very handsome, attractive, middle-aged white men in America, not fat, bald men that Kevin talks about, <laughs> how could they break a story about such an internal African issue? Well, in Uganda, around the election times last week, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, the, the, the government shut down the internet. 
And it's easier for Ugandans to call the United States during that period to, with a telephone than it was to communicate within Uganda. Because within Uganda, you can communicate easily on VOIP, voice over internet. V, what, VOIP, what are, yeah. V. <laughs> VOIP. Uh, be, yeah. Because cell phones are expensive mm -hmm. and and you can't really send, uh, you can fax documents, but you really don't fax documents over cell phones anymore. And so we, just by the accident of history, we were able to have copies of these documents without issues of them, but they were not able to be distributed to the media and they therefore they didn't get into people's hands. And so the delay between the date of the document, George and Kevin's announcement, and two days later, the Ugandan secular press's announcements was not any indication of trying to think of a good excuse. It wasn't like Emmanuel Wimbledon, we've got 28 days that we can prepare our story, but rather, you know, they worked quickly, they took full responsibility, they condemned utterly, and they said, this is as bad as the other behaviors were condemning. Sure. Church of Uganda's leadership on this point, I think, was solid. Very solid. Yeah. Um, no, no question about it. I mean, so, in the end, all these tragedies and stuff, the church can, through uh, obedience to scripture, prayer, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit, can come out looking good in this. The problem is, uh, oftentimes, we want to hide what's going on. And by not hiding it, I think they can uh, overcome this bad news that's currently going on. In, uh, uh, and because Archbishop... My wife is going to want to pass behind me now, so uh, she's coming in from outside. She's wearing her Green Bay Packer shirt, and they lost this week. I'm sorry, I'm burning it. <laughs> You're going to burn the shirt. <laughs> All right, so uh, you know, it, it's as hard stories, George. Well, the other thing to think of is because he's made a full and complete confession and asked for pardon and repentance, Archbishop Stanley can be restored to the fold of the church. Um, contrast that to the behavior of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Church Bishops of England who have refused to acknowledge any uh, issues with uh, Jonathan Smythe or Jonathan Fletcher or anything like that. Right. I can see Stanley coming back because you can be forgiven if you confess your sins and you can get a, you get a clean slate. Now he may not be given any position of authority but he certainly yes. But he certainly will be welcomed back into the fold as a repentant sinner. Mm -hmm. But you first have to repent. And that's and, what he did on Twitter to and, the church. And the it's world. repent and turn back. It's, you know, it's a, yes. It's a, you know, I don't want to get too doctrinal here, but it's a big theological point. It's not just saying sorry. All right. So next in the news, we reported last week about a uh, the first women bishop uh, that was consecrated in to or at least elected into the GAFCON in Kenya in, in GAFCON in Kenya and I thought there's gonna be a follow-up real quick what's the follow-up uh, well again that was a story that people said it's not true, not true. <laughs> well it was true uh, we had we had the story from somebody and when also we in our article we had a link to us a Kenyan news broadcast that was not in English, which was sort of fun because then people couldn't copy us uh, unless they spoke Swahili or Kikuyu. Well, a and a the story. Uh, Emily Oyango, uh, dean of students at St. Paul's Limeru Theological College, was last Saturday, a week ago Saturday, appointed not this past Saturday but the prior Saturday was appointed bishop, assisting bishop of Bondo. The synod affirmed the appointment made by the bishop. At, when that occurred, that sparked massive reaction among those opposed to the ordination of women. GAFCON in 2016 imposed a moratorium, 2017, 2016, imposed a moratorium on the consecration of women bishops. It was broken in December 31st, 2016, by the Church of South Sudan, when a woman bishop was appointed assistant bishop of Rumbek. The new prime, and that was by, uh, oh, his name just went out of my head. But the new archbishop said, that was a personal action of the old one. I will follow the back. Yeah, yeah. And Archbishop Jackson Ole Sapit 
has signed on to the ban on women, new women bishops in Gafcon. It's a moratorium. Not a ban, but a moratorium. Now, two women had run for election in Kenya, had lost before this point. And the Kenyan constitution and canons say any clergy over 35 and canonically good standing is eligible to be a bishop. And at the 2019 Kenyan synod in Nairobi, the, an amendment to the constitution was passed to change it to any male or female priest in good standing so that it wouldn't rely solely on grammar. Any priest, any man. So in other words, the old English standard of men, it stands for men and women. Correct. Uh, and this was passed, but at the 2019 Synod, Archbishop uh, Jackson Ole Sappet said, well, this needs a second reading to be formally adopted, but by the same token, I have pledged that get, our province will honor this. Fast forward, a, the Kenya's internal moratorium, which was adopted five years ago, ends. Uh, so we only have the GAFCON moratorium. We have the actions of the Kenyan Synod that is basically saying women priests, women can be bishops. The assistant, the Bishop of Bondo, who is a political opponent of Archbishop Jackson Oli Sapit and an opponent of Gafcon, he's part of the anti-Gafcon faction, appoints a woman bishop. We have the outrage. This past week, six members of the Bondo Synod filed a petition with Archbishop Jackson Ole Sapit saying this is all a fraud. The process to appoint a bishop was not followed. The bishop just steamrolled and strong-armed everybody. And besides, we're about $120,000 in the red and some priests haven't been paid in a year in the diocese. How can we afford a new bishop? And what does it say that the new bishop, who was dean of students at St. Paul's, has been immediately returned as dean of students at St. Paul's to exercise Episcopal ministry as Dean of Students of St. Paul's. So it is this telling us that we actually need a bishop or is the Bishop of Bondo doing some sort of virtue signaling to attract money from the West to bail out his diocese financially? So the appointment of Dr. Emily Oyango is not a done deal. It has to be affirmed by Archbishop Jackson Ole Sapit and the House of Bishops. And Archbishop Jackson Ole Sapit has to decide, does he have the political capital? And is the situation, and in light of the 2019 Synod saying it's okay, does he have the political capital to win a fight that the anti-GAFCON people have sprung on it? So politics and politics, wheels within wheels within wheels. And now let's say, out, let's say at the outset, the person of Dr. Emily Oyango is not at issue. No. Everybody can see she's a godly, intelligent, highly educated second woman priest in Kenya. If anybody's going to be a bishop, she should be, according to traditional standards. However, what was the motive in appointing her a bishop? Was it merit or was it tokenism? If it's tokenism, then we know what the answer is. Yeah, well... I mean, I don't think all of Trinity Wall Street's money has been given out yet. A lot of it went to Tanzania, well, as we've discussed. Maybe well, Bondo a... got, yeah, Bondo got fifteen thousand uh, dollars six mm -hmm. month, uh, a few months ago in COVID relief from Trinity Wall Street. So Bondo is one of the few Kenyan dioceses that mm -hmm. is uh, at the tap of Trinity Wall Street. And Trinity Wall Street definitely knows their address then to send another check to thank them for this little token of appreciation for trying to break up Gafcon. Good luck, guys. All right, any other news we got going on here, George? I have a story about Indian corruption. In yeah, okay, yeah, that's an oldest thing. joke in the world. That's the oldest Indian joke we have. Um, I, well, we the, have primate, the, the, yeah, the primate of South India is under criminal investigation for fraud, for selling uh, uh, admission to one of the that's church's it. medical colleges. Actually, we covered that on we covered that in a story about uh, four months ago. Yeah. Uh, oh well, uh, that's all right. It, it may go to trial soon, but it, uh, they got him dead to rights, pocketing money of. Uh, and, the, and the problem was he got greedy. He wouldn't share the proceeds with some of the other people, and they ratted him out to the government medical board. 
So friends, here's here's the trick of the mafia success. They share the wealth among the crooks. Yes. They don't keep would. it all for themselves. Jeez. Indian bishops, remember this. Share the wealth. Sure. Don't keep it all for yourself. Yeah. And then you won't get caught. Uh -huh. It's uh, something they do in the Vatican as well. Um, let's uh, quickly wrap up here. For those new to the program, Anglican Unscripted is a sister site of Anglican.inc. Anglican Inc. is where we post lots of stories about uh, Christian news around the world, Anglican news around the world. George is a senior editor there, and he does a, a wonderful job of uh, finding the news going around because so many people feed us stories. If you want to send us stories, send it to anglicantv at gmail.com. I'm going to put two more uh, emails in the show notes that you can send it to if you want to send it directly to George. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 642 of Anglican Unscripted.